You're on. Hi guys. Um, today we're talking about the rise of the church in the West. Most of this class we talked about uh, together in the classroom. Uh, so we might just review that, and then I have three more dates that I'd like to discuss with you. Um, so if you remember, we had the founding of a new type of monastery, and that ends up being important because our hero, Gregory, uh, ends up spending time at Monte Cassino. Um, after he stops being the prefect of Rome, he gives away all of his uh, father's possessions, and he moves to Monte Cassino. But the Pope calls him out of retirement in 579, and sends Gregory to Constantinople. Pretty lazy note writing. Um, sends Gregory to Constantinople, and Gregory asks the Byzantine emperor if he's willing to send an army, just the way the Justinian did twice. Uh, the emperor refuses, and that's not a personal thing. There's absolutely no way that the Byzantine Empire could have sent an army to defend it against the Lombards at this point. Uh, and then we really focused a lot of our class on uh, Gregory's papacy. Uh, and the roughly 15 years when he was Pope. And if you remember, we presented the thesis that Gregory is a great Pope because he sets the foundation for the power of the medieval church. And he does that in three ways. He builds monasteries, he wisely uses the patrimony of Peter for defense, food, and building programs, and he also has the idea to send Augustine of Canterbury to England. Um, he sends Augustine in the year 595, and by 597, the king of Kent has held a mass baptism. So there's been uh, the noble men of Kent have converted to Christianity. So we mark this as sort of the first conversion of the kingdoms of England. And of course, we have the seven kingdoms. Um, of England. So Kent has converted. The next big date that I'd like you guys to look at is uh, the date 655. Because in the year 655, the final pagan king, who was actually the king of Mercia, dies. Um, and so from 655 on, well, I guess right until today, um, the rulers of England have always been Christians. Now, Common sense tells us just because the rulers are Christians doesn't mean that every single person in the country is a Christian. Fair enough. But uh, the conversion of England, in contrast to the conversion of some other countries, is a top-down conversion. The king is converted, then the nobles, and then the common people. So this means that Christianity is going to trickle down throughout England. Um, but it's important for us to remember that there were some Christians in what we would call the British Isles, uh, even at this time. And up in, uh, in the north, there had been a pocket of Christianity that had survived. Um, and I'll, I guess I'm going to call these Christians the old Christians, because these people had inherited their Christian heritage from uh, way back in the 5th century when the Roman army was still defending Britain. So these Christians come into conflict with these new Christians, with these Augustinian Christians, with these Gregorian Christians. And whatever the conflict is really about, um, whether it's about power or prestige, um, they end up fighting about much smaller things. And when we have people who fight about um, small things, when they're actually fighting about a big thing, we call this a proxy battle. And I'd like you to write that down, please, as a key term. A proxy battle is when uh, you have a smaller fight that disguises the larger reason for the argument. Um, and I would suggest to you that you are actually an expert in proxy battles, because essentially every fight you have with your parents is a proxy battle. Um, the actual fight that you're having is, are you old enough to be in charge of yourself? Do you get to decide when you come home? Do you get to decide what you do on the weekends? Do you get to decide what you wear outside of the house? Um, and your parents' answer to that is no, 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 no. But instead you have these series of little small conflicts um, and you avoid the big conflict in general because uh, that would break your parents' heart. Seriously. Um, in history, proxy battles uh, happen 
all the time. A nice example of something that's considered a proxy battle might be something like um, the Vietnam War. That's a great example of uh, a war that was fought not directly between the United States and the Soviet Union, um, but was sort of a proxy for that, that Cold War. Um, all right, so the proxy battle we have here is the Council of Whitby. And the Council of Whitby takes place in the year 664. And the thing they're fighting about seems really, really small. It's, uh, the question of it is just when should Easter be? Velikten. When should that be? And the old Christians argue for one date, and the new Roman Christians argue for another date. Um, but this is a proxy battle, and essentially, whoever, whosoever date is chosen, these people will have control over the Church of England. So it's very significant that the new Roman Augustine Gregory date is chosen, because this signifies to us that the Roman Church has in some way gained control over the Church of England. So that's the significance of the Council of Whitby. Now, really here, I should cite some of my sources for you. So everything that I've told you about the Council of Whitby and the death of the last uh, pagan king and Augustine coming to England, all of this comes from a book which is called An Ecclesiastical History of the English People. And this was written by a man whose name is Bede. Although actually he has a, a title, which is venerable, which means respected. So we call him the Venerable Bede. So the Venerable Bede wrote this book in the year 731, and it's called An Ecclesiastical History of the English People. Ecclesiastical uh, is a term that we've talked about in some of our classes. It's just a, a Greek word, which means church. So this is a church history of the English people. Now, one of the most interesting things that we can ask ourselves is, when does he start his church history of the English people? <clears throat> well, he could start it with when Augustine arrives. No, that doesn't make sense, because there were Christians, actually, in England even before that. So let's go back. The earliest, then, that we could start really a church history would be if we went back and we said, okay, well, when did the first Christian church start? All right. Well, that's sometime in the 4th century, so that's when Bede must start. No. Well, we only call it the English people because the Angels were there. So it really doesn't make sense to start before the Angels arrive, and the Angels don't start arriving until the 5th century. No, it's even earlier than that. So it seems very strange when I tell you that a church history of the English people begins before there was a church and before there was an English people. The church history of the English people actually begins way, 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 way back. It begins even before Jesus. So it be begins even before there was a church at all in England. It begins with when Julius Caesar brought his army across the English Channel and conquered Britain for the Roman Empire. And I think this is really, really significant because I think Bede here hides a little bit of truth for us. And the truth that he hides for us is that Gregory when he went to Constantinople, he saw what an empire looked like. And he decided he was going to recreate a Christian religious empire. And we said that he sort of took over England here in 597. And then we see he defeated the final rebels in 664. And Bede sort of hints at that. He hints that inside the church has been hiding this little ember an ember is the little part of the fire. It doesn't have a flame, but it's just it's like a coal. You can cook over embers. So when you have a grill, you cook over the embers. There's this ember of the Roman Empire. And essentially, the role of the Roman Empire, at least in the West, has been taken over by the church and has been taken over by Gregory. So when we talk about the rise of the church in the West, we could also talk about the transfer of power from the empire to the church in the West. Traditionally, we're taught that the church goes through its steady rise, I don't know, I guess beginning in the year 313 when it becomes legal to be a Christian. But I think the real rise of the church comes later. It comes when Gregory takes over the traditional duties of emperor. Now all of a sudden he's in charge of defense, 
He's in charge of feeding the people. He's in charge of buildings. He's taking over countries. He's putting down rebellions. Although, of course, this is 55 years after. Sorry. Um, 60 years after. Um, but B gives us this hint that the empire lives on in the church. And I think that's one of the big themes I'd like you to hold on to for this class. Thank you so much.